Good morning. Today, I wanted to talk about the uh, Homesteaders Kaleidoscopic Perennial Kale Grex. What is this? <clears throat> this is uh, a collection of seeds from the Experimental Farm Network. At least that's where I got mine, from a breeder uh, named Chris Homanix, I think, if, if I pronounced that properly. And this is, uh, I, I don't always refer to this as perennial kale because some of my plants that I grew from this are much more like collards than they are like kale. And that's because these, these, the plants that went into this breeding process are related to both collards and kale. And so the, uh, the results are unpredictable, but really entertaining. And, uh, and in my case, I've been very successful in creating some plants that have been able to overwinter in my cold climate here. So I really appreciate the, this breeder's efforts in putting this together, and so I wanted to make a video about my results from this, which will be different from the results of anybody else who tries to grow it, but hopefully there'll be some similarities. So this, uh, this seed collection is, um, it's what's called a, uh, a land race, which means you take a whole bunch of related uh, types of plants, you plant them together, and you let them cross-pollinate, and you see what you get. And it's a great way for creating new seed varieties that, uh, that nobody's seen before. And so this is what, uh, what he's been doing by, you know, by creating this seed collection, is giving people the ability to create their own varieties of what can potentially be perennial vegetables for their own regions. Some of the seeds that you plant from this will survive great where you are and some won't, but by being a land race, he's got enough genetic diversity that the odds are high that if you plant enough of them, you will find one that will work really well in your region. So it's a, it's a mix of purple tree collards and Dobbinton kale. And like I say, both of these are kind of in the kale collard family. The funny thing is that purple tree collards sometimes look more like a kale than a collard, and Dobbinton kale sometimes looks like more like a, a collard than a kale. So the mix of the two gives you plants that have some, some have collard, more collard characteristics, some have more kale characteristics. Some shoot up or try to shoot up very quickly, some stay lower and kind of spread out in a different way. Some are a greenish in the, the leaf color, uh, some have purple leaves or have you know, purple, the ribs in the, in the leaves are purple. So you just, you have such a, such a diverse collection of offspring from, from this, uh, this breeding process. Uh, in, it's just diverse in many ways. So it, it's, I found them it, infinitely enjoyable and useful. Uh, so my first year of growing these, I ended up with two that survived the winter and kept producing the next year. So the first year they did not flower and the second year they flowered. And this is kind of typical for brassicas, uh, which they are uh, uh, varieties of. Uh, so in the second year, I let them go to seed because I wanted to create my own seeds from the ones that survived so that I would potentially have more that would have characteristics that would survive well in my yard. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, one way of doing that is by creating successive generations of plants that survive that do well in your yard. And you, you every time you do that, you kind of increase the odds that you will have something that will do well in your uh, in your specific situation. The, 
the methods of propagation, and I used a couple of different methods of propagation. One of them was creating, letting them go to seed, but another one was taking cuttings. Uh, actually, in, in, in this case, I broke off new stalks that were coming from uh, each of these plants and used uh, rooting hormone, put them into soil, and tried propagating them that way. And I had success, more success, with one of my two varieties than the other. So I, I gave away some of these samples, but I also planted uh, some in my own garden. And those that I planted are still going strong. Um, the the third way of propagation was unique to one of these plants. And I think it may have gotten this genetic from the Dobbinton kale, which from my understanding sometimes has, uh, has stems that are low to the ground, and those low to the ground stems are said to root in the soil around the plant, and then you can use those to propagate new, uh, new clones of the original plant. So it's sent out from right around the root area where the root was connected to the stem. It sent out these, these runners, and it did some of this underground too, sent out these runners, which, so the plant, which originally was one stalk, is now growing into kind of a collection of plants. And it also, this same plant, dropped seeds, which more readily self sowed than the seeds that were dropped from the other plants. So that's so anyway, the, the runners were unique to this one individual plant. So I will probably try and propagate that plant using its runners and giving those to friends and also spreading that around my garden because I found it turned out that even though it, it looked weird to begin with, it turned out that this was the plant that survived best or is surviving best this winter while the other one is struggling. Luckily, I propagated from the other one uh, a couple of clippings, and those are much more like the plant was last year, so I've, I've managed to propagate them, but as for being a perennial, it's hard to say, because what, so what happened was each of these plants went to seed. It sent up a stalk, and I let this large stalk grow, and that large stalk flowered, on each of these two plants. And after the flowering, the main stalk from each one died back. Uh, the one of, one of them, the one that spreads with the runners, it died back pretty much entirely. The one that doesn't spread with the runners, it died back to a certain point on the stalk and there are still some sprouts below that point, but I'm not at all convinced that those are going to survive in the long run, uh, or that they'll be healthy uh, in the long run. And I probably, I hope to be able to snip those off and use those to uh, to propagate the plant uh, just by cuttings uh, again. Although I'm not really entirely sure that this is one that I need to save just for, uh, for the future since once it goes to seed, it seems to be significantly weakened. One strategy that I'm using with that particular plant is instead of letting it bolt again with one stalk, I have been clipping it back to form more of a bush shape. So now I've got multiple stalks coming out of that. I'm going to continue to keep those clipped back and try and bush that out even more. And it's possible that when that flowers, uh, I can let some of those stalks flower let some of them, or keep, prevent some of them from flowering, and then I can test to see if the ones that flowered die back and the ones that didn't flower don't. It's just another experiment. I like to experiment with things, and so that's where I'm going with that one. Uh, as for care, like I said, I'm trying to keep at least that plant, but others, I, I'd like to keep them as lower bushes. I don't really want a very tall collard sticking up in the middle of my garden. Uh, just having one stock, it doesn't seem like it's as much production uh, for the, the space. And also now that I know that once some of these go to flower, the main stock dies back, I'm not entirely sure that that's 
the best strategy for long-term you know, saving these plants. So, so I'm trying to keep them as lower bushes. Some of them are agreeable to that or amenable to that. Some of them keep trying to shoot up, so I might just have to let some of them go and just see what happens. Uh, so I have one in particular that's more of a purplish color. It seems to more resemble a purple tree collared uh, sort of shape. And so maybe with all those genetics, it just wants to go uh, vertical. I'll probably let that one go vertical and see what see what happens with that. And maybe it'll make it through the winter. Um, I'm skeptical, but we'll have to see. Uh, so uh, so then the other you know the the other one that's already kind of growing out from itself. I'm just going to let that one go, and I'll take clippings off of it too. But uh, but I think it is able to sort of self propagate that way, which is a really handy uh, uh, trait. And so I hope to uh, hope to keep that trait going. So I, you know, as far as which variety I've grown is best, it's hard to say because I have started new ones this year from the same collection of seeds. And I don't yet know if any of those are winners. Some of them are doing really well this winter. Some of them, the leaves are, are browning a little bit and not I don't know if they'll survive. We have a, a very cold night coming up soon, and that's going to be a real test for them. It should get down to about five degrees Fahrenheit, and when that happens, I might lose some of these. I hope not, but uh, I think it's entirely possible. So, you know, but it's a good test because you know if I'm going to lose them, I might as well lose them sooner rather than later, and uh, and move on and plant new varieties that might uh, have the strength to uh, uh, to go forward. Um, the, the biggest surprises to me in growing these were that, you know, because this is advertised as a perennial uh, kale, that letting uh, these bolt was in, in, in both cases something that caused the main stalk to die back. It wasn't the cold over the winter, which is what I would have anticipated killing the stalk, it was actually the bolting process. So, uh, so for the one that you know doesn't have that strategy of sending out runners, this was it may end up being fatal. We'll have to see. So that was a that was a bit of surprise. From what I know about Dobbinton kale, when that goes to seed, it will then continue to uh, produce um, branches and flowers uh, going forward without without being harmed by the bolting process. So um, hopefully I can find more of these by planting out more seeds, uh, more of these that have more of that Dobbinton characteristic of being able to bolt and, uh, and come back strong. But I, I've also heard that some varieties of bolt, uh, Dobbinton kale don't go to seed at all. So I don't know, I've heard mixed messages. This is something that's much more available in, in the UK. It's not so available and in Europe. It's not so available in the United States. So I don't really have a good way of, of talking intelligently about Dobbinton kale. All I can talk about is this perennial kale, Grex, that I'm growing. But you know, the biggest successes really were the rooting of the cousin, cutting, <laughs> rooting of the cuttings, which I already talked about, um, the discovering the runner variety and growing that out. And you know, the biggest win here was that my whole family learned that we prefer collards or thing or, or plants that have that kind of collard shape and flavor to kale. And so many of the ones that I've grown, and like I said, I grew two out the first year and then I grew several out uh, the second year. Many of these that I've grown have had that more flat leafed collard like shape and the sweeter collard like flavor. So after trying these, then I started buying collards in the store just to compare, and it's the same taste. And so we learned is my son, who's 13 years old, and when we put uh, kale on the table, he groans. When we put collards on the table, he is ready to eat them. He doesn't, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't mind them at all. In fact, he looks forward to nights when we're cooking collard greens. So that's, I would say overall, that's, probably one of the biggest wins here. You know, I've, I've now got a perennial source of green food 
Uh, I can serve it to my whole family. Everybody enjoys it. Come back year after year, and you know, hopefully, I'll be able to propagate many of these into the future and uh, and find some uh, new varieties in this land race mix that I can share with the community and that will be productive as perennial foods in you know, my uh, hardiness zone, which is zone 6B. And so it's unusual to find things that will stay green all winter and that you can eat uh, year after year. They'll come back year after year while out replanting. So those are the biggest wins for me. So I'm very pleased with this seed collection. Uh, I would encourage you to seek it out. You can find it at the Experimental Farm Network. I think it's also available at other seed distributors at this point, and it's definitely worth picking up if you're an experimenter like me. Uh, I have some limited seeds that I'm sharing with people, and so if you contact me, I might be able to send you a few of them to try, uh, but they are also pretty easy at this point to find online. So. So good luck uh, if you decide to pursue that. Uh, I hope you will leave me any comments you have. If you've got experience with the, the Homesteaders uh, Kaleidoscopic Perennial Kale Grex, I'd like to hear what your experience has been. Maybe uh, we can you know, swap some seeds or even cuttings uh, to, uh, to propagate if we have winners. Uh, and uh, please you know, give me a thumbs up below, uh, leave those comments. And if you would, please subscribe to this YouTube channel if you're enjoying what you're watching, because uh, that's really helpful to me, it gets the word out. And uh, yeah, so I hope you have a, a great day. Uh, enjoy your gardens uh, and uh, enjoy your coffee.